6.36. Welcome back. You're watching and listening to Breakfast with Anne and Martin. Yeah, let's take a look now at today's newspapers. And children as young as seven will get transgender treatment on the NHS, and that's according to plans seen by the Daily Telegraph. In The Times, we're told middle-class students have been warned they face losing out on places at top universities that have recruited increasing numbers of foreign students instead. And The Guardian draws attention to England's childcare sector being at risk of becoming a playground for private equity. The Mail leads on a very interesting story. Mm. Albanian gangs advertising escape routes in lorries for people who have problems and want to leave England as soon as possible. So they're smuggling people in and they're smuggling criminals out. I look forward to doing that in the paper soon. But before that, finally, the star says, a moose stabbed me in Skeggy, as it's revealed that Joe Pasquale narrowly avoided death after impaling himself on a moose antler. Now, that falls into the realm of you couldn't make it up. In Skeggy. Yes, in Skeggy, well. a moose in Skeggy. But a I don't think moose. there was a moose attached to the antler. I think the antler was just was lying it? there. Something like that. We'll find out, shall we? Yeah. So we'll go through the papers now. And joining us this morning, we've got writer and journalist Emma Wolfe and a warm welcome back to author Susan Holder. Lovely to see you both. Great Thank to see you both. OK, why don't we kick off, Emma, with that story we just talked about there, the front page of The Telegraph. Children as young as seven will get trans treatment on the NHS. Yeah, well, first let me explain. The headline is quite misleading because the actual story is that the NHS is taking over this treatment, is taking over this area, which we know the Tavistock Clinic, which was controversially shut down last year, was um, that they were in charge of. They were treating children as young as three. I think this whole situation is an absolute scandal. I think that it is absolutely ludicrous that we have children of three, four, five, six, even seven, even up to ten, saying, you know, mummy, I'm a girl, mummy, I'm a boy, and we are allowing them to go into treatment and to begin things like irreversible treatments, like puberty blockers, mm. you know, like uh, treatments that they will maybe come to regret in later years. Anyway, the NHS are now taking over this area. They are going to have a minimum age, at least of seven, which, I mean, is still, to me, seems... And it's not, it's not for um, invasive treatment, is they it? They will not be allowed... They will not be... Li they will be limiting the use of puberty blockers. They will be banning activists and teachers from referring children directly to yeah. treatment... To, sorry, to treatment. Well, I mean, we've had the situation where schools, where children are socially transitioning... And I know teenagers who, mm. people in their class, are socially transitioning, yeah. choosing their other gender, choosing another pronoun, changing their name, and parents are not being informed. How can this be a situation that is acceptable, that you don't yeah. even get the parents into the school? It's not about pro or anti-trans at all. As adults, we have the right to make that choice. But as children, mm. children love to role-play, children love to dress up, children love to pretend that they're somebody else or change their names or whatever. All yeah. of that should be allowed. If, if families and young people are in distress, but, but they should be saying, given good psychological support all the way through. This particular headline is misleading. It is misleading. Because what it's actually saying, when they call it trans treatment, they're saying it won't actually be the treatment that you're fearing. It'll be talking. It'll be trying to find therapy. out. Psychological yeah. Yeah. counselling. Trying to find out why the child is distressed mm. in the first place yeah, about so that, their gender. Yeah, so I think they're trying to put the no brain... Longer, they want to bring to... Susan in on this. Yeah. Um, uh, they're trying to put the brakes on this, aren't they? Because yeah. um, ostensibly, rather than going externally to Tavistock, we'll have an activist teachers from outside schools come in and, and more or less hold this sort of conversation in secret. They're trying to mainstream it and they're trying to, uh, I guess, talk kids out of it. The question I'd put, like to put to you, though, Susan, is should this conversation be happening at all well, with seven-year-olds? No, I don't think it should, because I do think you can't possibly think that children seven, eight, nine, ten, even, you know, even a little bit older, are able to have that conversation. If you put things... They're very suggestible. And, and like Emma just said, the play and imagination that children... I mean, I taught children for years. I taught drama. I know how brilliant children are at taking on different roles and playing make-believe, which is an essential part of development and an essential way that children have always developed into, into adults and find their place in the world, which all children go through. It doesn't mean yeah. that they're in the wrong body. It doesn't mean that they want to be something else. And like Emma, I do know of people who are whose children are at schools where people are adopting different pronouns or are claiming they are a different species. 
species. Mm. I mean, it is ridiculous. Mm. And I do worry that if you start to have that conversation with, with, a, with a small person who can't quite grasp that, you're bringing in things yes. that puts pressure on them imposing. to think. Yeah. We are imposing. We're, firstly, young children being rushed down these medical pathways. And secondly, we're imposing all our adult yeah. confusion and lots of our ideologies onto children about I their don't identity. understand Let it. Let them be children. I don't understand what's going on with all this. Yeah. So how on mm. earth could a seven-year-old... And the thing I'm seeing in my children's peer groups, they're going through this at the moment, you know, and they're living amongst kids who, who are autistic and are ident identifying as trans, and they're changing their so minds. Hard. They're changing their minds after a couple of years. Oh, it's just a phase <laughs> I went through. But in the, in the wrong school... Yeah. That child could have been fast-tracked down... Into puberty blockers. And right. that, you will then be... That there is a chance you will be infertile for the rest of your life. If things like ovaries, breasts, all of the rest of it don't develop at the crucial stages, what happens to you in adult life? And there are people who regret it. Yeah, moving on to The Times, Susan. Yes. Foreign students are taking the majority of places, it seems, middle-class Brits are being forced out of unis. Yes, it is... Um, it's a worry that... In to, try and get, to try and keep universities going, to try and kind of find the money that they need to carry on in the, the world we, we are now finding ourselves in, um, that they want to rely more on bringing in foreign students. Because if you thought uh, your, your student fees were high at uh, capped at £9,250 a year, it is nothing compared to what they can charge um, foreign students, which can be up to £40,000 a year. Which obviously you can understand from a, a business point of view why a university would need need that but foreign students to come in. They obviously do need that, um, but it's whether th there is... And, and they're saying disadvantaged students, because they make up certain points on the on the tick boxes, will be given places, the foreign students will be given places, and the people who miss out, therefore, are the middle-class students in the middle. Mm. Um, it does say here, because it's a big story in The Times, that um, last year there were places on, uh, on offer for clearing uh, last year for international fee-paying students, but none for UK fee-paying oh. students. So what are, how are we meant to resolve this? Because the universities have to have money don't. to keep going. They don't. They're businesses. Don't. Um, but why, why should anyone be discriminated against because of that? No. But, well, they uh, should. Places like the UCL and LSE, up to half are international mm. students. So you've got all these international students who come to London and, and parts of the UK expecting the British experience and are actually saying, hang on a minute, I'm surrounded by other, <laughs> other yeah. international yes. students. And it's worth pointing out quickly that um, 400,000 student visas are granted per year. About a quarter of those stay on annually and become residents of the UK. <laughs> this is a huge part of the immigration issue. People are buying their way well, into universities. Well, and those two-year courses where you can you can bring your spouse and your children over as well. You know, they do have to earn a certain amount of money before they can stay here, though. Uh, I know when my son was at university, uh, an American student came and got married to one of the, um, other, the students that they'd met there, uh, genuine marriage, but they couldn't stay in this country because they didn't earn enough oh. money. But if you had children, it's unlikely that you'd be deported if you had children in Britain. Well, they hadn't got round to that. It's, it's, ba <laughs> it's basically um, has become um, a, a huge talking point about legal mm. immigration. Yes, but at least there's illegal immigrants who are highly educated. Yeah, but they're, they're also um, bringing lots of dependents in. Mm. It just places th pressure on things like public housing, um, you know, just facilities in general. It's just an issue. It's one of the strands of the immigration conversation. Well, talking about immigration, then, Emma, take us on to the Mail's front page, which is quite a dramatic front yeah. page, uh, basically talking about... Um, Albanian gangs, mm. isn't it? Bringing, smuggling people in, illegal immigration, and also offering them, taking good money um, from uh, British, uh, from criminals to actually escape them. This is the them. most Daily Mail headline it I've really ever is. seen <laughs> in my life. 2,500. People smugglers are cashing in twice by bringing migrants into Britain and helping f criminals flee across the channel. So this is brazen Albanian gangs, and their words, not mine, <laughs> who are advertising uh, people who have problems and want to leave England as soon as possible. So do you have a problem? Do you need to flee quite quickly? Well, it's a serious issue, actually. Of course it is. Because if, if, well, the, if, if But it's if a you're brilliant a criminal... business model. You've got empty boats. You've, you've, you've got over. to give them marks for entrepreneurship there, haven't you, really? I mean, they, 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 they get you in, they get you out. But, but if, if, if criminals are being smuggled in and then being nicked in Britain or, or, or offending in Britain and then... Plan A is choky, her medicine, his medicine's pleasure. Plan B is pay three grand to jump the country again and maybe come back again in the future. <laughs> it's a serious issue. It is, and one, um, one of the Daily Mail reporters posed as a relative of a killer on the run and was told that he could escape the continent this, you know, tonight. So there no we go. problems, that, straight that, away. That, that now, I know that there will be a lot of people watching who will say, great, let's get rid of criminals. If they want to pay good money to people smugglers to get of out of Britain, then isn't that... 
Isn't that good? You wouldn't think it if you had been a victim of one of mm. these no. No. criminals. That's it. But it's... <laughs> I mean, it's just extraordinary. It really is. It is. Um, they're paying three thousand pounds to, to evade justice. I, I think the fact that they're advertising openly and that there are adverts have been seen on TikTok and mm. things. Where are they getting the it's... three thousand pounds from? Well, that, that's that's another question because the Albanians, as we know, have taken over the cocaine racket in Britain. Right. Um, they, they, they are be, importing they? criminal fraternities precisely oh, to to, to, ha to have criminal activity here, mm. and then they're paying money to escape justice. So it, it's it's. Almost the perfect racket. It is. It is. It is. It? As you say, we've got the empty boats. You've, yeah, you know, you've dropped your people off. Use them mm. on the way back. Mm. You don't want. You don't want empty planes, and you don't mm. want empty dinghies, do you? Yeah. Susan, on a more sobering note, <laughs> um, high street banks must do more for savers. We all agree with that. Well, yes, and um, in the eye today, there is an exclusive Q&A with Andrew Bailey, the um, Governor of the Bank of England, <laughs> which I turned to excitedly to find out, although I had trouble because it says uh, inside on page eight, and then you open it and it's not on page eight, it's on page six. So they weren't very good with the numbers right from the beginning. Um, <laughs> That's but, a worry. <laughs> yeah, I know, but eventually I found it on page six and looked for all the answers that he was going to give for all the very interesting questions, and actually reading it was a bit disappointed because guess what? He didn't really give any answers at all, mm. um, and there was quite there's quite a lot of um, back and forth with um, questions about mortgage rates and housing. He's kind of batting it back to the government. The government, therefore, the J Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says it, 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 he's pointing the finger at the Bank of England for any additional financial pressure on households. And between the, the kind of two kind of camps, w w you can just feel like a tennis ball in the middle, can't you? Really, it sounds a bit Say. like a politician. Just oh, absolutely. <laughs> Did you not I feel for you. I know it's going to hurt. Yes, but yeah. this is. Still what I'm going to do, and 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 it, and it is quite a campaign actually. The way the way he's talking, as though he, he wants to be elected, because it's all like, well, you know, our job is to get inflation back to two percent target. Doesn't quite explain That's how he's. That's the point, mate. That's the point. How, it doesn't I, I, say I, how he's going to do he's that. He's got a cheek saying this. The headline: mm. High Street Banks must do more for savers. What about the Bank of England mm. getting control of it? Who has created this situation? That's their one uh, job. Their actually, one job is to keep inflation at two percent, and he has failed abjectly for years now. Yeah. And Guess what? Andrew Bailey is blaming everybody else. Mm. I just thought this article made me really angry, actually. Yeah, because let's not forget that the Bank of England printed like £875 billion pounds mm. during lockdowns mm. and pandemic, a quantitative easing, they called it. It's basically furlough and giving money away. Mm. Guess what? Yeah. It gave us a spiral of inflation. Well, this is inflation. Yeah, but eh? guess what? Who pays for it? It's not the Bank of England. It's yeah. not him in his salary it's either, millions. is it? It's, it's us. It's taxpayers. Yeah. And you know, the Bank of England had its fingerprints on spiralling um, inflation rates, and now it feels like we've been punished at the other end as well by spiralling interest rates. Yeah. It makes you wonder how people like this can keep their jobs. It does, really. But at least they are talking about now putting interest rates up for savers, which they haven't even been mentioning mm. uh, or, before. And they are saying that. And they are saying that a list of uh, a list will be published of every lender's saving rates ranked from best to worst every six months so people can keep a check on that but I mean I really don't think I mean is it like swapping your kind of energy provider it isn't really but swapping from yeah. one bank to another does it really That's make that just much ticking difference a box to make yeah. yourself look good yeah, yeah. Not yeah. absolutely We're not fools, absolutely really, are we? Yeah. meanwhile if you're trying to afford childcare so that you can go out to work <laughs> um, apparently uh, privatizing it is just going to cause problems I was going to be all calm and rational now and I'm in the thick of this getting my three-year-old into a decent preschool for September and honestly honestly the childcare sector is an absolute mess in this country <laughs> everything's a mess the childcare you know anybody who has young children will tell you that you know finding provision finding a nursery or a school that is uh, reliable that doesn't decide that they're going to close because of staffing issues that doesn't that isn't losing their staff constantly that is properly funded that has enough provision for places for the children in their area mm. anyway Anyway, it turns so what's out the that, Guardian worried about? Well, the Guardian is worried that a lot of investment funds have been doubling their, you know, they're, they're investing in private in in the childcare sector because guess what? It's a very lucrative business. It's a huge cost to, to people across the country. In London, the costs are staggering. More, it would cost me more than private school to mm. have my my son in in full time nursery. More than private school. When you say full time, is that sort of nine to five? Anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, five days a week. Yeah, exactly. And how much-ish would that come to? Oh, it's thousands, it's thousands of pounds a month. 
thousands of pounds a month more than private schools. And I just think the mm. early years sector, we focus on schools and it's great at schools, you know, free school lunches, all of that free school provision, obviously, for everybody over four. Um, but if you are looking from the age of sort of one, two, three, mm. it's absolutely staggering the cost. And, and the people who are going to lose out on this, I think, if you struggle to get childcare, the people who step back and decide not to work and stay home are, are women. And it, 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 is all, it, it really hasn't but moved on. But it's a loss on. to the workforce. You know, you, you, you've got, it's such a you've loss. got thousands of people who cannot get back into work. And, and, and it is women who are always, it, it seems to be, always the ones who have got the burden of trying to source the childcare. Mm. And if they, you know, and, and, and it, until it becomes more of a conversation across the board for parents and not just for mothers, I, I do think we've got a problem. As, as the token bloke on this panel, I'd just like to say uh, that I was a stay-at-home dad for, for quite a period of time. Mm. Um, I pulled my bit. I couldn't get five days a week childcare. Nowhere. It was impossible. No, no. It was so hard and so expensive. I basically had so no life until my kids started school. And when, since they started school, I was like, phew, I've, I've got some I money know. back. I am so it, 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 it was that. It was that <laughs> draining. But yeah. I would like to say this. Part of the inequity of, of, the, man, of, the, of the man and the woman thing is that, is that women often get nice maternity packages. Men get 128 quid a week for two weeks. And a lot of men would like to get involved in childcare. I did a load of work on this, like Sweden, progressive societies where men are empowered and treated with equity, yeah. often step up yeah. if the incentive is there. In Britain, however, we still are locked into this kind yeah. of and I think the maternalistic the, the, the model. Yeah, I think it is, and I think the conversation needs to change. I mean, I had my son 28 years ago, so this is not a new kind of situation. Yeah. And it just not, doesn't seem to have progressed that much. And my husband, who is not somebody who people would have thought would have done this, I don't think, because he was he was an older dad, he's 20 years older than me, he worked in the music business. He stepped back from his job when our child was... Because, because I was working, and he would take one day a week off so I could get... Because I was still working part-time, and so we didn't put him into nursery the whole time, we just did a couple of days. And it, it, so that was, and that was, that, that was then, uh, and not now. Yeah. But, um, but, but recently, when the government... Because they are injecting £4 billion a year, they say, but yeah. recently, when Jeremy Hunt announced extra target hours from 2025, I literally spoke to the nursery nearby and they were saying, where is this yeah, going to come yes. from? Where's the provision going to come from? We don't have the staff. We pay cover. nursery staff so poorly okay, in this OK, guys, country, I'm like being... I'm being workers. They're, they're screaming in my ear. We have yeah. to move on. Emma, Susan, fascinating stuff. Look forward to seeing you again in the next hour. Yeah. Thank you very much.